Hello, everybody. Bob Oxley here. It's time for tips, topics, issues, and positions. And today, what we're going to talk about is something new and interesting. We're going to talk about virtual reality and its influence on society. And uh, if you recognize this face, this is our program manager and technician here for the tips program. I've invited Dustin Matei, who just uh, came back from presenting an original paper uh, to the uh, uh, Pacific Sociological Association in Oakland, California. Uh, welcome, Dustin. This Thank is you. this is different, isn't it? it is You're on different. that side of the camera. It's a lot easier when I'm the one pushing the button and exiting the door. <laughs> there you go. Well, listen, I uh, uh, we always start off with the basics. Okay, so we're talking about virtual reality. Uh, what does that mean? Because the majority of us have not even had an opportunity to. Uh, we see it on TV and some of the commercials and things like that. The, we're, Everybody's wearing these masks and that type of thing. Right. Can you kind of like start us from the basics and then we're going to get into where you're at as far as your write-up? Right. So we have, uh, we've all known about social media and its uh, pervasiveness on the internet, uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, some of the things that we're using to get the, the show on the road and showed it to uh, multiple people. Um, those are not kind of the areas that we're looking at. The uh, areas that we're talking about are virtual worlds, are virtual communities mm. where individuals go to talk about, uh, you know, in this instance, for my paper, it's about sharing stories, creative writing, and it's about uh, creating uh, groups within worlds that are created for usually people who play video games. Wow. Okay, so we're, we're actually going into those communities we hear about. I've read about those a little bit that people kind of like put themselves together in a different way that they are that they want to look like or we'll talk about that but is that what yeah. we're talking about there we're going to look at communities right so we're looking at communities and the individuals so we have divided into the player which is the real life person that comes up to the game and decides to log in and the character that they inhabit which is the agent of their action while in that game and we'll be looking at the the two of those guys and how do how does the transfer of social capital from the real world transfer to their in-character agent and how does that affect their agent's life oh my gosh this is going to be this is going to be very interesting so uh, you're going to have to put up with some uh very simplistic questions i'm sure to start with uh so an individual wants to get involved with uh, virtual reality so how do they get started what do they do where do they find these communities where are they you can do a Google search. Anything that you are interested in, just type it in. If it could be, you know, if you're interested, as long as virtual communities, for instance, you could type in airplanes and you'll get a number of hits on forums about virtual. Uh, you can do simulators. You can do talking about uh, these airplanes, you know, how to become a pilot. The Internet is just filled with these opportunities for us to outreach to each other and become to socialize in these new groups. Wow. So if somebody wanted to uh, go into it like a regular community, like <clears throat> a virtual reality community, mm -hmm. okay, where they're a resident citizen and uh, what, what would they look, how they, would they look up on the Google? What would they put in for that? For uh, what type of? Well, just a community, like you wanted to get oh. into, a re be a resident, uh, there's a city, uh, school systems and. Yeah, I mean, there's. Function There's local uh, communities that you can type into. So if I wanted to do a St. George uh, Quilting Association, I could put in St. George Quilting, and I would get hits about people who are developing online groups wow. to uh, to quilt. Wow. You know, so it's just it's every every type of uh, direction of human social of groups is going online. That's amazing. So let me ask you a question as to why do people do this? Why do they want to get into the virtual world? and actually temporarily leave the, the reality. <laughs> I, we call it a leisure activity. So I guess we could say, you know, why do we have hobbies? Why do we have these instances where we go out and do something other than the mundane work and, uh, and sometimes, you know, separate ourselves from other communities that we have in real life or that we have in active life? Uh, we can go to uh, church services and stuff like that that are all essentially giving us these social uh, opportunities in our lives. And the virtual world gives us that opportunity as long as we seek it. Um, the Internet is always something that I've said is if you want to look for something, you'll find whatever you're looking for. Okay. So uh, uh, what do you think about an individual that is um, 
under a lot of stress in, in the real world and does, and they can go to this virtual reality world and get away from all that stress. Do you see a lot of escapism going on um, based on your research and some things that you've t- looked at? I see that people do enjoy having the opportunity to relax and take away from the stress of their normal day. I don't think that's something exclusive to the virtual world. I think that's something we've been doing since the day we've had stress. Okay. All right. So tell me a little bit about your analysis. What, how was your, how did this all come about? And you got this idea right. and obviously you've done some great research because the national conference invited you to present your paper out in Oakland just the last week. Yeah. And, uh, I just, uh, first of all, curious about what, what was your paper about? And secondly, is, uh, some of the responses that you got while you were out there amongst all of these, uh, sociologist or you were presenting to. So right. I was pleased to have a very uh, positive response to the paper that I was doing. Uh, it was very, it's built more scientifically. It's more uh, quantitative at the point when I delivered it. Uh, it is meant to be a mixed method uh, approach where I wanted to get an ethnographic study as well. And that's come later in, and that's actually something that we might talk in towards the later okay. of this. <clears throat> um, as far as what we are looking at, we're looking at a virtual world that's inside, uh, a game called Elder Scrolls Online. Elder? Elder Scrolls Online. Scrolls Online. Okay. Yeah, and this is a, they call it an MMORPG, and that's a lot of those little words that kind of fly by the screen, but it's called a massive multi-user online role-playing game. Wow. In other words, the game is built for you to take upon roles to kind of go through the game and you progress as you do this. And so there's a cultural, there's a lot of cultural in, uh a rich con- uh, context that's very culturally rich that allows players to come in and interact with this world that's been created. It's, there's a, you know, there's history, there's, it has its own history, it has its own political agendas, it has its own uh, separations of, you know, good and bad moral problems. And you are coming in from the outside and your agent is now interacting with this world. And we're going to take it a step further that says, now that we have a bunch of people playing together, they want to be in groups and they want to be in groups that are the same. And this kind of separates them out. And this is where the paper started to really formulize. Wow. So, uh, this is what, this is what I, you were referring to previously that you actually recreate yourself, right. but in the virtual world, uh, I'm assuming that, uh, any pitfalls that you have in the real world, you're not going to have those same pitfalls in this virtual world that you're going to candy coat it and change yourself so that you're more receptive. I mean, you do present your best self. Got it. And that's one of the things is we want to give our best selves, even when we we first meet someone, right? It's that two second judgment. And uh, that's kind of the trick with the virtual world is you have anonymity through most of it. Uh, Even through like these uh, systems, like uh, it's called discord, which is a, a communication system between groups. You don't have to tell them anything about yourself. You just tell them that you're this character playing this game and you show your persona, this, this talking persona that may even be different than your in character persona in the game. Wow. And that's wild. No wonder people, uh, enjoy going to things like this and and recreate themselves and test things Mm -hmm. out. Wow. Yeah. And the lack of consequence for the individual is I think what motivates people to expand and to explore these them and identify themselves through different means. Um, there's a lot of exploration of if I do this or if I do that with my character, what are the repercussions that would happen in a society like this? And a lot of the societies that we develop inside these groups, these subgroups within Elder Scrolls Online actually reflect what we know as uh, social beings. And it's from what my data is pointing at, it's uh, relatively accurate to real world event to real world socialization. So when you were presenting out in California, did, did the majority of the people that were listening to you presenting this paper and you started out just telling basics like you're doing for our listeners here today, mm-hmm. what did you find that there's a lot of people that are fully aware of these things or am I, I must be too old and out of the loop. I, I, Cause when you brought this to my attention, I had no idea that it was this sophisticated so far and, yeah, the, the biggest thing I got was, wait, I thought video games were everyone just wasting their time and a bunch of, you know, kids making under $20,000, which both of those aren't exactly true. 
Wow. Um, another one was, I thought nerds just played that game and they were really good at it. And that's also not necessarily true. There are people who are really good at playing the game. And then there are people who are good at the socialization of groups and enjoy that part. That's fantastic. Okay. Um, I'm, I don't want to st stop you. So start talking a little bit about your paper and some of the things like that, and we'll just move forward. And I'll, I'll ask you a lot of silly questions, yeah. I'm sure, because you're all of the in-depth research that you've done on this. So I'm just glad you're here. No, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk about it yeah. because uh, virtual worlds to me are just a space of human interaction. And this is kind of my step to say that uh, we have to build that bridge to kind of to kind of get people normalized to understanding that. And so what I chose to look at is social capital, which is like the ability for us to act within social structures and what resources are available to us as we go through these actions. Got it. So it's like human capital here. We're using education and experience. So what you're right. doing is social capital through virtual reality. Right. Wow. Okay. Go ahead. That, that's a, you know, that's a, very, I'm getting it. <laughs> yeah. It's a smaller portion of the whole capital package that we're talking about, but we don't have a lot of physical capital. Uh, just the physical capital is the ability to connect to the internet. You know, you have to have a computer that can play the game with you and that's kind of your physical capital. And that's something that pretty much all the gamers have equally. Okay. Right. Uh, social capital was the ability for them to, um, influence and control their their character's destination through social means. And so that's why we, I wanted to attach that myself to that one so that we can actually have predictors that say, if I'm influential, if I'm doing well with my social capital in the offline world, would I have success in another sphere? Mm. And there are some theorists that, that present that say, uh, like uh, Bordeaux, Pierre Bordeaux, who says, or Bordeaux, sorry, Bordeaux, he says, you know, if you have dominance in one place, you're going to have dominance in other, in other spheres. Mm. And that's something that we wanted, that uh, I wanted to test when I went out with the survey that I uh, presented last fall. Um, some of those questions that I asked were um, kind of measuring that kind of thing. Like, uh, how do you have, like, looking at social networks out of, offline? Offline is considered the real world as far as the gamer speak that we have, the lingo. And those who had more friends who recognized or responded to saying we ha I have more friends online. They also had a higher online satisfaction mm. as well. In other words, they were taking advantage of the social structures built within the online world because they were already good at having offline friends. They were already good at making friends. Oh, that's interesting. Right. That was interesting. Okay. Um, following that, we talked about the skill possession, the talents and stuff that we use in everyday communication. Um, that's that's something that's very specific in this guild is that I found out that everyone enjoys good communicators and good communicators are usually those who have social, who are using good social capital and the right words for the right time. Um, in that I measured, if you were an officer, did you recognize that potential? And I found the majority of people who were officers, which in this sense, officers are those that hold power in the subgroup. Uh, we, we're going to call it the initiates, that subgroup. The initiate subgroup had an officer ladder that's a bureaucratic in nature. Mm. And those who have higher tiers have more power within that structure. Therefore, they can influence more things that are going on. They hold more social resources than the others that uh, are not able to get to that, that tier. So we found that those who were that tier, that, that upper echelon of the guild, they were more likely to recognize that their offline skills gave them potential gains in the online world. That's amazing. I'm just, I'm just putting all these pieces together. Right. So it's almost, here we go again with the haves and the have nots as far as social skills are concerned, really um, parrot themselves in the virtual reality world. Right. And conversely, like we measured it like standing next to each other. Yes. Those who weren't officers, 80% of them did not think that their offline skills would help them in online, online ventures. Hmm. So this shows that that, that, Sometimes the understanding that, you know, you have skills that can actually help you in, an, in a sphere is actually a limitation for your social capital. Very interesting. Right. Very, that, okay, keep going. I'm, right. I'm, we have I'm, plenty, I'm, plenty of stuff here. I'm enthralled. I, this is amazing. I love it. So one of the other aspects of social capital is gender. 
And so we, I wanted to take a look at, does gender play a role in my, in who is an officer, um, who wants to be an officer, yeah. and the experience of, uh, not only the experience, but also the perceived experience of the experience for individuals. And uh, what we found is that the, off, the virtual world at the moment is dominated by male players. Uh, in so other words, patriarchal ideals transcend even into the virtual world? Yes, in the sense that in this moment you have more men playing video games than women. In, in the initiates, we had a ratio of about 70% were male. There was so, and then there, you had the other 30%-ish that were female. Now, this was, rep, this was representative in the officership. So you had, you know, roughly 70% males were officers, 30% were women. And the attitudes for women and men was open. It was actually very, uh, women, women should have the same rights as these officers and stuff like that. That's, you know, that's a lot of what we believe and what we speak is, is that way. But the undercurrent, which is what was very interesting, is not so much what was thought, but what was happening in the minds of the, of the participants who responded. For instance, uh, when, when we said, well, if these are, let's, let's ask people who aren't officers, if you'd like to be one. Men, uh, at a ratio of about 63%, no, 64.9, excuse me, 64% said that they would want to be an officer. Women, roughly only about 40% said they wanted to be an officer. Hmm. So the, the desire or the push to become an officer was less in female players than it was in male, in their male counterparts. Oh, interesting. Which you might, you might say kind of pushes that, that culturalization of the patriarchal society that we live in kind of showing itself that, you know, women aren't yes. expected to be officers. They're not expected to be in this position of power and they may be looked at differently if they did. That was something that we want to try and get uh, more out of through our ethnographic and our research through there, but we can go through that later. That was great. Wow. So yeah. when, so another aspect of that gender is we wanted to understand does dominance, uh, usually what we understand is, you know, the fish is the last one to know it's wet. And, and what I mean by that is um, being in power, you don't get to see the other side. You don't get to have, there's a veil between you and the, and the person without power. And so I asked the question, does gender uh, create a, di a vastly different experience online? Okay. And uh, women responded positively by 90% that they saw a difference between gender as far as the treatment and perceived experience. So the discriminatory policies that we see in the real world transcend into the virtual world. Exactly. Wow. Men saw I never would have thought that. You know, I, I never would have thought that. Yeah, I mean, and I asked a lot of other questions like, do you think that racism's in there? And do you think that, um, do you feel that the LGBTQ community is more readily available? And a lot of people said that had you know, mixed methods or mixed uh, results that said, you know, racism isn't as strong here or uh, LGBTQ communities were more accepted in online uh, situations. But then we have this gender experience perception and it was vastly like men saw it by about 62% mm. said that, yeah, there's a difference, but women saw it almost 100%. Wow. Now there was a little bias in this because I did take out the neutral selection. So they had to either agree or disagree. Okay. And I, and my, my belief is that because I took out the neutral people sway to the positive and said, yeah, I mean, there's gotta be a difference. Right. And so they put agree more than they disagreed okay. on that. Good point. Good point. All right. So that's interesting. I, yeah, I, I never would have thought, didn't even think about gender and the discrepancies and discriminatory policies on the virtual, I never would have thought that they did, would have existed. Right. And again, it's not the, it's not the attributes of the, the initiates that's, that's doing this. It's the actual transfer of what social capital is and how it is used gets transferred from the real world to the virtual world. And that's, that's again, that's, that's to speak that, you know, they're trying very hard to be representative, but at the same time, there's, there's culturalization, there's socialization, there's institutionalization that's happening in the real world, and that is getting kind of mixed while they're trying to create their own subgroup in this world. This is, 
you, you, I'm, I, this is all new. I'm listening, listening to you. I just like, this is great. We've got to keep going because this is yeah. great information. <laughs> I, I, I never, honestly, I, did, I would never have even thought about a gender discriminatory policy at all or patriarchal ideals being transcended to the virtual world. That just, that's amazing. Yeah. And again, this is part of that step where I was saying from the beginning is that human space is a social is a so, is made of social events and therefore the virtual world is merely a continuation of our social experience and as we get more involved into the virtual space we're going to see the culturalization the institutions the institutions and the uh, and the culture that we progress from here is going to become more and more in, embedded in how we interact with each other wow i'm think we're transcending social constructs developed in the real world into this virtual reality world. Right. Where we're making new social structures. And, you're, and your, your research is, is verifying that. Exactly. Oh my gosh. So that's, what's really exciting. That's why we went to Oakland to kind of to speak on that. And it was, again, people looked at it and said, this is, this is incredible. I mean, this isn't something that people have looked at before. And here we are little town in Dixie, Utah going or Dixie, uh, St. George, Utah looking at this. Yeah. I mean, this is absolutely amazing. I'm so happy you're here. I mean, when you started talking to me about it, and that's why I wanted you, I said, you, we've got to go on the air with this because it, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are active in the virtual world mm -hmm. and uh, just the results that you found are going to be interesting to them also. Right. Okay. And we'll go, we're going to go a step further because, you know, that's not all the social capital that gets transferred over. Okay, go ahead. Give me um, another one. Let's give you the next all one. All right, let's do it. <clears throat> And we'll try and get cut through. Uh, it, we had a question of demographics, and I asked individuals how much they made annually. And during that annual, we had those who made seventy-five thousand and up. We marked as, or I marked as, high-income earners. Those who made less, and the bracket was divided up. There was three brackets of high-income earners, and then four brackets of the less category. So I did recognize that there is some bias in me selecting what high-income mm -hmm. earner is. But I thought that by selecting the lesser group, I would be making an, a kind of like a, a check to that bias, which would give the lesser income more opportunity to be a part of the officership okay. versus the lesser bracket being more limiting. And what I found there is that those who had a high income, 80% of them were officers versus their, their low income earners were more about 48%. So right, right there we had the, that, this is where I put that online potential, that recognition of the how to use social structures, how to use my uh, networking, how to, you know, get paid. I, I'm a high income earner and I'm playing a game where I'm role playing as this agent and my, my dominance, my perceived dominance, because no one asked me how much money I made when I entered this guild. They just said, who's your character? Oh my gosh. But my online dominance comes through and says... I should be dominant because I am dominant. And then they become officers. Oh my gosh. So, so are we saying from an income standpoint, social economic status, status, status yeah. is transferred into the virtual world, even though it's not proclaimed, even you, though it's not proclaimed. Oh my gosh. And gender is not proclaimed either. Like they don't ask you your gender. Oh my, I, so these oh, are all invisible. This is even more remarkable. The results right. that you, I don't know if people are, this is just, this is all brand new. This is amazing to me. And, and the clincher for this, and we can start to wind it down with this one clincher. Those who had a high income, but weren't officers, a hundred percent of them wanted to be officers. 100%. Like that's what, that's yeah. what I deserve that. This is where this I is, belong. This is where I belong type of statement. If, not, if I asked the question, if you are not an officer, would you like, would you like to be one? And 100% said yes, versus the lower income bracket was split about 53 to 46. That's amazing. Amazing results. Uh, we're going we're gonna to just take a short break here yeah. for some messages. Uh, uh, to our listeners, don't, don't go away. Uh, Dustin Matai is going to be back with even more fascinating results from uh, on virtual reality versus uh, reality. Our home, it, 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 this is amazing. We've gone through gender and we're going through the... Uh, the social economic status, it's amazing to me, even though it's not proclaimed going in. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, we'll be right back uh, after these messages. Okay. Bye now.
Welcome back, everybody. It's Bob Oxley here on tips, topics, issues, and positions. And today we're going to continue talking with uh, Dustin Matai, who's relaying some of the information re and research that he's done and results of going from reality into the virtual world. And uh, it's, uh, well, here we go again, Dustin. Uh, I'm amazed. We had uh, gender uh, discriminatory policies, even though gender is not proclaimed going in. We've got social economic statuses that are being adopted, even though income is not even proclaimed. So what else have you got there that's expired? This is absolutely amazing to me because if I, I would have answered both of those, gender discrimination as well as social economic status, uh, pre uh, uh, prestige and that. I, I've said, no, that's not going to happen in the virtual world, especially when you don't tell people who you are and what you are as far as gender and economic levels. Uh, it's, it's amazing. So uh, welcome back, everybody. And here's yeah. Dustin Matai going to give us some more information about his presentation out in Oakland, California, Pacific Sociological Association on virtual reality. Thanks for being with us. And here we go again. We've got another 25 or 30 minutes worth here. Right, so we'll try and fill it up. Lay as it on me. <laughs> yeah. We kind of left everyone out of cliffhangers. This <laughs> invisible uh, social capital uh, resource was kind of unveiled yeah. to them. Um, I went back and I looked at the application that I put in for this guild. And actually the only questions they asked um, what's considered out of character, which you'll see off commonly in this paper is labeled OOC. The only OOC questions that they mentioned to me was do you understand the rules of the guild that are out of character rules? And I, I said, do you, I checked my little box. I said, yes. Um, the other questions were all based on my character, what I wanted him to be, what kind of identity I wanted to hold within this guild and what kind of person I would, you know, they tried to get an idea of what kind of character would be kind of following the rules or not following the rules type of situation. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So they had no idea that I was, a white, a white student, a male, who, you know, may or may not be, a, you know, a go-getter at this time or someone who's a, who, who's a high achiever. And, you know, maybe I ascribe to those, maybe I believe those, internalize those beliefs or not, but uh, <laughs> they had no idea is the, the point. And going through, I got to start to, you asked me, like, how did I start to get the idea that this might be something? And over the course of a year, I was, you know, talking with these individuals, I was, I was, uh, writing with these individuals and I was getting to see just how, how this was at the same time I was learning sociology and they kind of just meshed the two together. And I was like, wait a second, and this is a lot of what we're talking about is what I'm learning about. And I'm getting to see that just from being a casual observer. So what happens if I turn myself from casual to, to researcher? And that's what kind of bore and started digging into this. This is great. Yeah, I'm, I'm like I say, it's just a fantastic research. It's just, go, go ahead. I can't wait to hear more. No, this is it's fine. <laughs> um, there is an opportunity. For, we wanted to talk a little bit about the Dixie State symp, uh, symp, uh, Symposium, right? Right, and the innovation. Research Symposium coming up, right? Right, and this yeah. will be one of those papers that are uh, oh, an oral presentation. Oh, you're going to present there? Yeah, as okay, well. Okay, at the symposium. That's I think it's on April the 18th. Correct. Uh, here on Dixie State University campus, that's going to be exciting. You, that's probably going to fill up. Uh, you're going to fill up that room. I, would I don't. Think. We'll I don't see. know. We'll, we'll see. We're getting it on the radio now. So that's we'll right. See what it's, we can do. it's out there. So great. Um, the other half that we were talking about is an ethnographic study of the uh, of the arena mm -hmm. of the of the initiates. And this is a religious guild. Um, the interesting thing is that all the, not a lot of people in the guild actually talk about religion outside of the get of the game there is a game the game has built in as we said histories and there's lore and there's experiences and rules that we all agree to as soon as we push that button to log in and one of those is that there's eight gods known as the divines and they have each one has its own sphere much like the greek uh, pantheon okay and so the initiates have rituals where they that surround these these eight divines and people interact with them. People uh, select them as patrons, and they start to worship them, and they start to uh, even become clergy themselves and start to propagate that faith through these interactions. And one person that I interviewed uh, named Victor was a priest of one of these divines. Victor, in real world, is a deist and doesn't believe in religion. 
Oh my gosh. So there was a struggle for Victor as kind of going through and going, how am I authentic? How am I going to be believable that my character believes in these things, even though that I'm not necessarily a believer? And what was amazing is Victor talked about being pro- having a lot of pride in his contributions to the guild. Now I'm talking Victor as if he as if it's a he. I'm using pronouns of he, but Victor is actually a female. Oh. So right there, right off the bat, we have <laughs> any assumption that we can make on these characters are kind of thrown out the window. That's amazing. When I before okay. I did the interview, I had no idea that Victor was a female. I, I put on my thing and I said, All right, Victor, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining in. And a female voice came over the phone. I'm like, Oh, that's <laughs> surprise. <laughs> It really, I mean, yeah. there you go with the gender you were talking about. So you really don't proclaim anything. You have no idea who these people are. No idea. But their individual experiences dictate their ability to use social structures. And that's what social capital is. So if social capital says, if I'm limited, if I'm living my own social capital, because I don't feel like I have the ability to use these, these resources and to implement change on my social structure, am I going to do it? And we found that through this study, even if we go to a virtual world, that's not people still don't use those social structures. They don't, they're not using their social capital that they may actually have because of limitations that are put on them by the real world. Wow. That's, that's amazing in itself. That's, that's a definite conclusion yeah. that we can do it in the real world. But again, I'm, gonna, I'm probably repeating myself 10 times here. I, when you, what you're finding in, as a result of your study and your research is that the virtual world it actually is parroting the real world. Yeah. Even though the individuals that are in the virtual world have every opportunity to change that. Right. They have the change status. to make their own identity. They're in, they're in a make-believe world. They're in a fantasy world that, you know, the only difference is that these look like human beings. They're not necessarily called human beings. Some are called, you know, elves or dwarfs, you know, the Tolkien, Tolkien type of experience. And, what people still are doing is having the same social experiences that they're having in real world. They're just making them um, in this new virtual space. And there, and you, so you said, you asked the question, well, there's a lot of stress in my world. There's a lot of stuff going on. Yes. Can I just kind of sit back and play this game? Yeah. And the question, the answer is really like, you really are just going to find the same type of thing. You're going to have the same, you're going to have politics. You're going to have, um, religion, you're going to have, you know, genders, you're going to have uh, socioeconomic statuses that are in play. And I would just, I would have thought just the opposite. Here's my yeah. thought, and I've never been in the virtual world, so I'm talking really as an ignorant outsider. I would have gone in the virtual community that we're talking about, and I would have maybe modified myself, my character, uh, and any shortfalls I may have had, and, and to take advantage of the the strengths and the weaknesses and to get change things around so that, wow, this is exactly the person I want to be where by the outside um, pressures don't allow me to be that person on the, in the real world. Mm-hmm. And what you found out in your research so far is that it doesn't matter. I mean, those things are all going to, no matter if you try to do that, it, it doesn't work. It's going to come through these, these perceived, the socialization yeah. is going to, it's going to materialize. It's going to ri- rise to the top, right. even in the virtual world. Right. Now, you can tell a different story. You can be, you know, you can be a dwarf that swings a big club and says, you know, fancy words all the time. Or maybe he's a poet, you know, and you always wanted to be a poet. And you can try to be a poet. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to use your social capital that you've accumulated in the offline world to progress your character beyond being a club swinging dwarf that can say nice words. Wow. Okay. You know, so you're not you're not going to the point that it, so anyone can play the game. I think is the so when people look at a game they go, "Oh yeah, I can play that." You know, you can play poker, but that doesn't mean you can be socially good at co- poker, right? Good. And that's kind of the differentiation <laughs> that this that this kind of shows. All right. So, can, you got another one for us? I've got gender, I've got uh, social economic status, we've got uh religion. We just threw religion out there. What else have you got? What else did you find? This is so interesting. Um, so I talked to, uh, we'll call him Lucius, for my paper is actually who we're talking about. And Lucius was someone who was considered a, one of these upper echelon officers. And I wanted to get his understanding of 
uh, how the guild is put together and how do we take how do we take so many individuals from the world and put them into one one what's guild this initiates guild and kind of are we building social capital through that and I chose this I chose this guild and I chose to talk to Lucius because of the um, the intricacy of the events, the professionalism of the events, and the consistency of the events. Um, coming through a content analysis, it found that each of these events are scripted and they are uh, controlled down to the to an understanding that when you ask a question, this is what you're going to get in response, or a high, mm. high probability predictors. So this is in the virtual world. That's like an algorithm already built in there for responding? Is that what right. you're saying? Right. Yeah, okay. so they have this... Uh, they have a script where they kind of you come in as a freshly new character. Okay. And Victor kind of talked about this uh, when he said, I, "I came into the guild and I was excited because I saw how structured and how well managed it was. So it's very professional, it's very uh, clean appearing, and it's very uh, you know there's a, something for everybody going on, and that kind of you know is like a light to people and it attracts a certain clientele." You might say you might if we put this into economic terms, they're having a product, and people are excited to come and try out this product. Got it. And so I talked to Lucius, and Lucius kind of explained to me that these are things that have been proven through this uh, virtual gaming community that the uh, initiates are a part of, and this gaming community c- covers you know ten different games, or has and ten subgroups wow. in those games. So there's. There's a lot of people that are thinking. There's a lot of structure that's going involved in this, and it's a it's a bureaucratic structure with a community officer, executive officer on the top, who manages all this stuff and manages PR. And they have or they have PR um, officers, they have community officers. Then they really just try and take care of the community and make it like a little micro, like it's almost a virtual city. Huh. You know, you have different neighborhoods and all these different games, and then you have their uh, their individual managers over those so the community's always there and these are just games that um you can enter into that are you're a resident of this community and this is just an one game that you've selected to play right. and it may be different individuals yeah in that oh, okay and that's free movement so as long as i'm a member of the community i can go to any of those other cities uh and make a character re- reinvent myself so to speak reinvent my identity inside this world wow and uh, not nece- they won't necessarily know that I even had a, anything in the other world. And so that just, you know, that same talk about that uh, socialization, the social capital that gets developed. There, what, this, what's I'm, what I'm noticing is that there's a development of social capital within these observations, within this content, mm. content analysis, uh, just because the, uh, the management of the guild the management of these events are being taught to new people. And there's a, they have something that's called a mentorship program okay. where those that go through the initiation of the guild reach a high rank and they call it paladin. And those paladins then teach the culture, the history and the uh, norms and values of the initiates, the guild to the new people. And they, they habitualize them and they get them socialized, culturalized, and institutionalized into what it is to be a part of the initiates. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just interrupt here. So I'm, I'm envisioning as you're talking. So realistically, you've got a lot of new immigrants yeah. coming in, and you've got the leaders that are saying assimilation is here. Here's the norms. Here's the value systems. Here's what. Right. And there's gatekeepers to cover that too. So you have to sign an application. And as I said, I had to put an application where I talked about my character and then they reviewed my application and said, you know what, we'll, we'll take the, we'll take the risk on this guy. Right. So, so you feel honored to be I part of the community. feel honored because they have, they have standards, right. And therefore you, you understand that anyone that you're going to, you know, play with, that you're going to start interacting with are going to be in similar standards. Wow. That, that works yeah. because people then are excited about being a member and proud to be a member because it's selected. They're, they've been right. selected. As we saw with Victor, Victor was proud after uh, he had gone through all the ranking. He went through, you know, there's a pilgrim's call, which is when you're first, you got your application submitted and approved. And now you get to present yourself. You get to be a character in front of this, in front of the guild 
and you get to tell about your backstory, how you got there, um, you know, something that might be interesting about you, you get to tell everybody. And then you take this oath that binds you to the conclave or to the, to this religion. Well, just let me stop you there. Cause yeah. I'm trying to invent, envision images here. Right. So you as a character, whatever that is in the virtual world, you're actually presenting yourself in front of, let's say, a panel of other individuals. You have I one mean, individual. Are you actually seeing that image that your interface right. and answering questions to? And they're, you're in the virtual world. Are you actually seeing that? Is that the is that the screen that you're seeing? I guess is that the image in, that you're seeing? So in the application, you are presented with a person who's standing before you, kind of like an interview, and you write you write your responses based on the fact that you're in an interview. And then you come to the pilgrim's call and there's an individual that calls you up to the front and everyone else is an audience member watching you behind. And you get to kind of be there and get to share your backstory or the lack thereof to everybody. And you get to give your character life into, oh into the guild. Gosh. This is, and it's, and people would like that, especially starting right. out a nice structured community. It's a structured start. interview. It's a structured, uh, uh, acknowledgement of my existence. You know, where I can say, hey, they see me. They understand that I'm here. And it gives that, that get push for these people, these individuals, including myself when I was in here, to move forward and to achieve the next so rank. So you found yourself being a typical human being and saying, and, and the, the makeup of you as a human being, those traits are coming out right. in the virtual world. Exactly. This is amazing. Okay. Continue on. I right. don't mean to interrupt. I no, know you got fine. lots and lots of information. So, no, it's fine. And we can we can go through the uh, the, the rituals and ceremonies that get someone from a new initiate to actually ranked. The first membership rank of, of good standing is called Sentinel. And to get there, I have to become a I have to become a pilgrim, which we talked about just barely, where I take oaths, and I and I say, you know what, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be in this guild. You're not considered a member yet. At this point, in oh. in character, you are considered someone seeking entrance. Out of character, you are numbered in the guild as one of the guys on the roster. But in character, you're not quite there yet. So you go to a mentorship program that we talked about, and that mentor teaches you about what it is to be in the initiates and to be part of the guild. After they check you off, a gatekeeper again, they give you the check, you get to be presented into the whole guild at one of the weekly guild ceremonies. And you kind of stand up there and it's a very proud moment for these characters because you have just, you know, achieved several to-do list items and you're being recognized and promoted to membership status. Oh my God. And you get to, you get to have more, uh, more, uh, resources given to your character. They have, uh, action items that you can do in, in stories, but you can't have those action items until you become a Sentinel. So once you're a Sentinel, you get more, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's another to-do list. If you want to be the upper echelon, you want to become one of those paladins who are gatekeepers, who are actually, you know, managing the future of the guild. You have to do a little bit more, and then they'll have another presentation of you in front of the whole guild in this guild ceremony, and then you'll be a paladin, and you get a little bit more ability to act and a few more resources that are given to you in character and out of character. This is like career trajectory. Right. The, I, and, and the ones that are self-motivated... They do really well. They do really well. The ones that kind of are com complacent, they're kind of fall off to the, w the wayside. Right, and there's people who feel that they are casual players, and they make that active choice to uh, stay Sentinels, where they just kind of want to come in and play when they want. And then there's people who really want to go, you know what, I want to build something. I want to be a part of something. I want to uh, be a part of this Paladin rank. And they start uh, showing promise, and then they may be... They may be from the future pool that get promoted to even higher. Let me just throw something at you. I'm thinking about the individual that does want to, that feels good and is now working hard toward the next step. Their self-esteem in the virtual world is being reinforced. Does that carry over, does that carry over to the real world then? A new perspective on yourself, saying, I can do this? In other words, it's... That is something that I want to start looking for okay. as I go through this data. Because I think loud. there is a recursive, there is data that shows that social capital develops and grows. Uh, Bourdieu says this. Um, J.L. Hemingway says this. His leisure activities, even if the leisure activity isn't designed to commit and to teach social capital, 
and how to use social resources, we learn from each other through these processes. And as people develop into this paladin rank or go up into officer ranks, they are developing themselves. And there's even development from the community that comes down and says, hey, this is how you can be an officer. This is how you can manage yourself eff- effectively. And they make that aware <clears throat> as you're moving up because they have identified you as a potential officer. Right. right. And so you, you're, you're kind of nourished. You're kind of developed. And so it makes sense that that development is going to come to you on the other side. And that virtual, in that group interaction, that in, the exchange between social capitals and understanding of what resources I can use is going to be something that we can see on the other. That's amazing. So um, do you see, this is based on your research now, do you see any dangers as far as the reality of society's, society as we know it, the real world? Right. And people falling <laughs> into more and more people getting introduced to virtual reality. Do you see any dangers whereby that could have a negative influence on the real world society? Are people getting lost in the virtual world? Um, yeah, I mean, I asked some teaser questions through my survey. One of those questions was, what type of media sources do you use? And I found that those that use things like Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, who use those more than community spaces, mm-hmm. they reported lower online satisfaction. And we had another thing that told us that those with lower online satisfaction did not say they had as many offline friends. So I see a trend, a possible pattern there that would be something I want to look at. Um, I call those the three, the Twitter, the Facebook, and the, the, the social medias. Those are, to me, competitive media sites. And this is a new term for you guys that are coming out. This is from Dustin Matei, undergraduate. Okay. But these competitive media sites put ourselves out in a, in a fashion that even if we're not competing with others, others are looking at us and saying, you know what, that person has a great life. And that puts us in a competitive nature, a competitive mode, whenever we're online. Now, contra to that, communities, communities help develop us. They help enrich us. They help... Um, socialize and we get social interaction from these communities where we're talking to each other and we find that those people are are have a higher online satisfaction versus those that spent more time on these competitive media sites so I think there is a danger in being completely competitive instead of being social beings like we like we should be okay and you're bringing all this socialization into the virtual world I'm just as you're talking here I'm thinking the other way now yeah. What about the virtual world giving you the necessary self-confidence, self-esteem that you're not currently getting in the real world from there and you carry that back the other way? Yeah, and I mean, that, do you, do you th- I mean, and I know you're doing research on this, but yeah. do you think that's feasible? Could that, could, think, could that happen in the future as we become more and more sophisticated with virtual reality and gaming and things of that sort? Yeah, I think it's something that we've seen through simulations as well. Um, we teach people how to be pilots through, um, through virtual simulations. Uh, we teach people how to clear houses through simulations, and those are cap- those are forms of capital. Uh, understanding how to use our social capital is just another form. So I, I do think that if we go into these virtual worlds and we are instructed on how to communicate, and we're instructed how to not only not only do we get to make mistakes, like if I make a mistake here in the ver- in the real world, and my social capital is not very good, and I make a big goof, and You know, I'm no longer going to be a, you know, say I decide, well, I'm not going to be a student tomorrow. I want to reinvent myself. All the, all that work kind of gets put away, but in the virtual world, I can just reinvent myself and I can be the same person. In the real world, uh, a bad decision can be catastrophic, Mm -hmm. but in the virtual world, eh, right. I'll, I'll redo it again. Right. No one in the, in the initiates in character actions had in character consequences. And therefore, if my character was bad, that wasn't necessarily my out-of-character player. So I could, as a player, I could say, well, my my character's bad, so I'm done with him or her. I'm going to make a new one. Okay. Well, I hate to tell you this. I told you time would be flying by. We're getting, uh, we've used up our time. Dustin Matei, thank you very much for coming in and presenting your findings and uh, relaying about virtual reality (laughs) as opposed to reality and societal and uh, your your virtual capital, human capital, and uh, it, it was really interesting. And this time just flew by. Thank Brand you. new, new area going into it. That's the future. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Bob Oxley on tips, topics, issues, and positions. 
You can listen to this program at 3 o'clock every Friday and rebroadcasting on Saturday at 5 p.m. on KDXI 100.3 FM. Or you can take a look on Facebook, Twitter, uh, podcast, which is Podbean. Uh, even Alexa says uh, you can just uh, ask her and uh, she'll give you the, the, the program called Tips. So until next week, this is Bob Oxley signing off and goodbye now.